Hello, everyone. How are you? Are you tired or inspired by uh, GLEF 2020? I bet you are inspired by it. Well, um, already six days passed. We have uh, last day of uh, Bible study and lecture. And uh, tomorrow we will finish. I'd like to introduce uh, the leadership of Nehemiah and Cyrus, king of Persia. I hope you can enjoy this uh, lecture and we can uh, discuss more about it. Okay? The conclusion of Nehemiah Bible study, I'd like to talk about the leadership of Nehemiah and Cyrus. Why Cyrus? Well, it is because God raised Cyrus to liberate the people of Israel from uh, Babylonian captivity. And historically, also, Cyrus was the, one of the greatest leaders in human history. That, that's the reason I um, included Cyrus in this uh, leadership. Before talking about the leadership of Nehemiah, I like to talk about the background of Babylon and captivity, according to Second Chronicles chapter thirty-four through thirty-six. You know, Second Chronicles thirty-four starts with the story of Josiah. Do you know how old Josiah was when he became a king? He was eight years old. Well, who is eight years old in our ministry? Maybe Nehemiah Kim in New Jersey or Ezra um, Schweitzer in uh, uh, Bone Ministry. Well, even though he was young, he did, he did what is right in the eyes of God. And one time he was uh, fixing the temple, they found the book of Moses. And this young man stood by the pillar and read it and learned the sin of his people. So there was a great reformation. He was such an excellent king. But he made a mistake. When Pharaoh, Nico, the king of Egypt, marched against the king of Assyria, Josiah went to war against Egypt. This was a big mistake. At the time, uh, Assyria Empire was declining and the Babylonian Empire was emerging, emerging. Also, God said not to go. He disguised himself as an ordinary soldier and fight against Egypt. But the arrow struck him, he died. His son, Joachim, uh, became a king for three months. Nico dethroned him and took him to Egypt. And his brother, Jeho Ahaz, became a king for 11 years. But, you know, uh, he made a mistake. He sided with uh, uh, Egypt and Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, bound Joachim and, uh, with a bronze snake, took him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar took articles from God's temple, but he did not destroy the temple and the wall of Jerusalem. It was 605 BC. The Babylonian captivity was counted from that year. Well, there is another uh, uh, scholar said, maybe not, but I counted, uh, you know, calculated but this is the time Babylonian captivity started. Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, became the king, ruled uh, Jerusalem for three months and ten days, exactly 100 days. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he took him to Babylon, and his uncle, Zedekiah, became a king for 11 years. God said, don't rebel against uh, Babylon. 
but he rebelled against Babylon in spite of God's warning. Then Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem for two years, and he destroyed the temple of God, burned all the palaces, and broke the wall of Jerusalem completely. He took all articles from the temple. He took all Jews, young and old, men and women. It was the saddest day in the history of Judah. It was the year of 587 B.C. When the 70 years of God's discipline was over, God raised the king of Persia. King Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. And he made a proclamation through his realm and sent many Israelites back to his homeland. The Bible scholars believe that there was uh, between 2 to 3 uh, million Jews in Babylon, but only 50,000 returned to the promised land. There was uh, three returns under the uh, leadership of Zerubbabel, uh, 5,000, under the leadership of Ezra, about uh, 1,500, and under the leadership of Nehemiah, 5,000 people came. Well, so let's talk about Nehemiah. Who is Nehemiah? Since we want to learn about the leadership of Nehemiah, we don't know much about him except he was the cupbearer of King, king of uh, Persia. Later he became a governor of uh, Jerusalem, right? He probably born during the post exilic period and lived in the sister of Susa. He might be a young and handsome man like Daniel, Daniel Gage, without a physical defect, and shows great aptitude of every uh, kind of learning and quick to understand. So he was qualified to serve the king's court. Among the such, uh, many such men, he was chosen to enter king's service as a cupbearer. You know that uh, first 5,000 Jews returned from Babylon in captivity. They uh, rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem, right? But they could not rebuild the wall of Jerusalem because of opposition from neighboring countries. The wall was broke down for 58 years after the first exiles returned to Jerusalem. About 140 years had passed since destruction of Jerusalem. It was a long past stories, right? But Nehemiah heard about the broken wall of Jerusalem. He fasted and mourned, right? As we know, he worked as a cupbearer of a Persian king, Artaxerxes, the most powerful king at the time. You know, socially, uh, he was a very successful man, right? Probably he was rich. He didn't have to really worry about 800 miles away uh, Jerusalem. But when he heard about the broken wall of Jerusalem, he prayed and mourned, right? And he thought about how to rebuild a broken wall of Jerusalem. You know, uh, Nehemiah is a great man. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, we can learn many aspects of his leadership, right? But I chose 10 things, but I will talk about only three, uh, first three. Right? But 10 things is like he was a man of detail uh, or faithful to the small things, a man of vision, a man of responsibility, man of prayer, a man of a careful listener, a fair-minded person, know how to speak, know how to serve, know how to work together. And the final one is improve your integrity 
through studying uh, Nehemiah. So I want to talk about the uh, first three things, okay? All right. First, he was a man of detail or faithful to the small things. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, we can see that Nehemiah made the detailed plans before he did things as a leader. Luke chapter 16 verse 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with many, uh, very little, can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with small things will also be dishonest with much. I like to uh, talk about uh, some stories, okay? All right. There was uh, one of uh, Samsung computer engineering job interviews. Those who passed the first written examination were invited to the final oral interview. That was a very typical Korean uh, job interview. At the final interview, everyone became nervous because they did not know what to expect, right? The interviewees waited for their terms according to the direction they uh, received. When uh, one young man was called, he entered the interview room. Walking toward his seat, he saw some waste paper on the ground. He just picked it up and dropped it into the trash and went to his seat. Then one interviewer told him to take it out of the trash and open it and read it. So when he opened it, do you know what it says? Welcome to the company. The story was like this. Every interviewee passed through that uh, waste, waste uh, paper, but this man saw the waste, uh, waste paper and picked it up and threw it into the garbage. The interviewers saw him as a man who cares about small things. That is why he was hired immediately. I want to tell you another story. Do you know who was the first man in space? Well, you might remember his name is Yuri Gagarin. Do you know how he was chosen to ride on the first spaceship? Let me tell you. Among the thousands of applicants, 20 people were chosen to the final interview. Among the 20 people, only one person would be chosen to ride on the spaceship. Before the final interview, the spaceship engineers showed the inside an exact copy of the ship, postdoc number one. Everyone was excited to see the inside of a spaceship which they might ride on. When everyone was invited to the inside the spaceship, they jumped into the spaceship except the Gagarin. Do you know what he did? He took off his shoes and entered the spaceship with his socks. The engineers saw Gagarin as one who carries the spaceship. They saw Gagarin as the one who was faithful to the small things, and he was a man of detail. That was the reason he was chosen to fly Vostok number one and became the first person in space in human history. Likewise, Nimai was faithful to small things and went into details. His faithful to the small things is revealed from Nehemiah chapter 2 throughout Nehemiah. One day, King Artaxerxes noticed Nehemiah's sad face and said, Why does your face so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. You know, the cupbearer should notice whether kings had a sad face or a happy face, right? Not 
other way around. But king knew his cupbearer very well. Probably Nehemiah's heart was sank, and he had an emergency prayer and answered to the king. He said, if it pleases the king, if your servants has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. King heard, king heard it along with the uh, queen. And then they asked Nehemiah, how long will your journey take? When will you come back? Obviously, it pleases the king and was willing to send Nehemiah to uh, Judah. Then we can see his detailed plan in order to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and made the inhabitable, unhabitable place from uh, 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 inhabitable uh, place. I, I want to talk about the three things. Firstly, he asked the king for letter to the governor of uh, governor of Trans Eucharides so that they might provide him safe conduct until he arrived Judah. Well, it seems like nothing. But he knew exactly how dangerous it was, even though he never visited uh, Judah. Secondly, he asked the king for a letter to Aspa, keeper of a royal park, so that he would give Nehemiah timbers to make beams for the gates and for the uh, city wall. Well, it seems like nothing, right? I already talked about that uh, Nehemiah never went to uh, Jerusalem, but he knew exactly what he needed to build the wall of Jerusalem. He knew exactly how many timbers he needed to build up the wall of Jerusalem. He was a precise, a man of detail. Not only did he, the king, grant Nehemiah his request, but he also provided army officers and cavalry to ask the Nehemiah. Thirdly, he, when he arrived at uh, uh, Jerusalem, do you know what did he do? Slap? Maybe so, because it took at least uh, three, four months. But he had a detailed plan. He set out during the night, not telling anyone except a few loyal men. He examined the broken walls and gates, but nobody knew what he was doing because he was uh, uh, examining the uh, city at night. After examining the entire wall, do you know what did he say? He said to people, Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. He knew exactly what he must do. He had a confidence in his heart that he could do, rebuild, rebuild it along with his people. He was a very uh, meticulous man. I can say that he won the victory before fighting. So he divided each section according to family and town people, according to their ability. Because of his precise plan, everyone participated in rebuilding the walls. There was a, a, a man named Baruku, son of Zebai. He zealously repaired the wall. There is another man, Salum, worked with his daughters, Maybe he did not have sons. And there was uh, goldsmiths, perfume makers. They all participate. Some people hand, handled the two sections. There were 42 groups of families assigned to the job. And Nehemiah encouraged them to complete their jobs. Do you know how many days to complete the rebuild the wall of Jerusalem? Yes, only 52 days. 
After completing the wall of Jerusalem, what did he do? Big party? Not yet. Next, he made a list of exiles, chose which family would live in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem became a really good place to live and easy to access the temple of God. And there was also a ceremony of the wall of Jerusalem. He made the arrangement, procession arrangement, and brought the musical instrument, made the two chorus. He was a truly very precise and meticulous man. In other words, he was a man of detail. He, you know, we are engaging in spiritual battle every day, whether you realize or not. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Without planning in detail, we cannot win the spiritual warfare. One of the greatest uh, missionaries of the 20th century, Hudson Taylor said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness is a little thing is a great thing. Are you man of or a woman of detail? We can be man and woman of detail if we have a self-discipline. So may God help us to be man and woman of in detail. Okay, the second quality of Nehemiah's leadership is uh, a man of vision or visionary. You know, Jerusalem was Westland more than 140 years after the uh, fall of Jerusalem. There was nothing except the broken buildings and walls. There were rubbles everywhere. Who could want to live in Jerusalem? Their enemies easily could come and destroy the city, right? It was actually a ghost town and abandoned the city. Who wants to rebuild this, such a wasteland? No one. But Nehemiah had a vision to restore Jerusalem from a wasteland from God's dwelling place so that the word of God might overflow from Zion, Jerusalem, to all nations. After he got the permission to visit, he went to Jerusalem with a vision to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, right? But reality was quite different. There were so many enemies around, the, uh, around him. His people were fearful. But after he examined the wall, Nehemiah said, Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Because he had a vision of God to rebuild. When the wall of Jerusalem reached the half its height and the gap was being closed, the enemies were truly angry, stirred up the fight, right? But he was not frightened since he had the vision of God. He said to his people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. With his vision, the wall of Jerusalem was completed in 52 days. When we look at the chapter 13, he did the final reform, enforced the Sabbath law and marriage according to the law of Moses. These settings became the national identity and lasted 430 years and kept them as a Jew until Jesus came. He was a, a man of a truly vision. There are Two people who had a vision for their uh, own countries, like Nehemiah. One is William Wilforforce in England. Another one is William Stewart in America. Let me tell you first, William uh, Wilforforce. 
Do you know uh, William Wilberforce? Well, let me tell you. He was born in uh, Yorkshire in England, 1759. He graduated from Cambridge and began his career as a politician. At the age of 21, he became a member of the House of Commons and then a member of Parliament. At the time, England was called United Kingdom, UK. UK was the most powerful and richest country in the world under Queen Victoria. They could say the sun never sets in the, uh, on the United Kingdom. Their merchants, merchant ships reached every corner of the world, brought the wealth to England on the protection of powerful naval fleets. But there was a stark side of history in the nation. One third of national income was from the slave trading. Once William saw black slaves mistreated and sold like animals, he saw thousands of slaves die of abuse and hunger and sickness. In spite of country wealth, it was reported that one fourth unmarried women in England did prostitution and one-eighth of the people died from alcoholism. Wow! So William questioned himself, why such a population was corrupted in this way? At age of 27, he saw the national situation. He wrote his diary, two visions, two abolish slavery and bring about social reform from corruption, especially public prostitution and public drinking. But his polit uh, political colleagues laughed at him, except his friend from school, William Pitt, who later became the prime minister. Other politicians thought it was impossible for the William to challenge the rich merchants, rich uh, colonists and rich uh, aristocrats who control the things with the powerful lobbyists. These small, small men, however, challenged the uh, members of parliament and abolished uh, slavery and public prostitution and drinking. He had more than 150 debates in the parliament. During those debates, he faced numerous threats and escaped from two assassinates. He was slandered, abused. He fell into devil's snares all the time. But he endured with belief and faith in God. Probably, he was influenced by his uncle, John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace. On July 27, 1832, right before his death, the bills were passed to abolish slavery and end public prostitution and drinking. He was the first man before Abraham Lincoln to abolish slavery in history. His vision was fulfilled because of his vision, United Kingdom was saved from corruption. Many people think that United, United Kingdom was changed from a corrupted country into a country of gentlemen who sent many missionaries in the 18th century, 19th century, because of him. Some great missionaries were born because of him, like David Livingstone, William Carey, Hudson Taylor, to names of few. I like to talk about another man. Do you know who bought Alaska? Well, I found out that original name of Alaska was Alaska, the great land. Do you know who bought Alaska from Russia? Well, his name is William Henry Stewart. He was born 
Florida, New York in 1801. He was appointed Secretary of State by Abraham Lincoln in 1861. After Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson kept William Stewart as a Secretary of State. Under William Johnson, William Stewart bought Alaska for $7.2 million from Russia on March 23, 1867. Only $7.2 million. Maybe Missionary John can buy 10 of them. Russian negotiators were happy to sell this useless and inhabitable land to America. Funny thing was, the Russian Tsar gave a lot of bonuses to those Russian negotiators to set out the snowy-covered Alaska. Well, was William Stewart welcomed by his own people? Of course not. William Stewart was ridiculed by calling Alaska many bad names like Stewart's, Stewart's Fully or Stewart's, Stewart's Icebox or his polar bear garden until his death. Do you know that he wanted to purchase more land in the Caribbean islands? But people didn't allow him to buy them. If he bought the, those islands, maybe the history of America might have changed into different ways. But uh, there is no if in history. Well, why did he want to buy many lands surrounding U.S. territory? You know, he had a, a clear vision for America. When he was called to the senator's hearing before purchasing, purchasing Alaska, the senators asked him why. His speech was incredible at the senator's floor. He said, Alaska is not a frozen land, but it is the tra treasure land. I'm not trying to buy, uh, buy the frozen land, Alaska, but I am trying to buy the hidden treasures in the land. Nobody knew what he was talking about. <laughs> he said also, I'm not trying to purchase this land for my generation, but to purchase it for the next generation. The bill barely passed by one more boat. Now, how much people of America enjoy Alaska? Without William's vision, it was impossible to purchase the Alaska, right? Do you know how much treasure is hidden in the snow-covered Alaska? You can imagine. Alaska is priceless, tremendous natural resources along with the natural beauty which the next generation could enjoy. He was a man of visionary. Do you want to be a man and woman of vision or want to be a mundane person? Well, this is your decision. As Nehemiah shouted, let us shout, let us rebuild the world of Jerusalem with God's vision so that America and Germany to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation. Third one, last uh, we, learn, we can learn uh, from Nehemiah's leadership is he was a man of responsibility. You know, uh, when the wall of Jerusalem reached the, in its height, the enemies of God tried to fight against the people of Judah. We already talked about it, right? Then his people lost their strength and were scared to death. So what did uh, Nehemiah do for this? He commissioned the ordinary people, ordinary people as your soldiers. Basically, he made <laughs> soldiers. Much more than soldiers. With the one hand, they carried materials, and the other hand, they held a weapon. He and his people continued to work from the first light of dawn till the star came out. At night, Nehemiah did not go to the governor's mansion. 
You know, he was governor. He guarded the wall from his enemies with other people. He did not take off his clothes and put down his weapon. He was a man of responsibility. You know, he could say, you know, I'm a governor. I have to do many things, so you have to take care of it, and I want to sleep. But he did not do that because he was a man of responsibility. He took response, uh, took everything as uh, himself. You know, I like to also talk about the two uh, people uh, on this man of responsibility. There is a Japanese soldier whose name is uh, Hiro Anoda. Do you know about him? Maybe some people. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army, sent to Dubang Island in the Philippines on December 26, 1944. Well, after he arrived there, after eight months, Japan surrendered to the America, right? August in 1945. But he did not know that the war was over. He hid out another 29 years in the mountain. We don't know exactly how he survived. He lived in the cave and <laughs> steals somebody's food. <laughs> when he was found by local people, he refused to surrender until his former commander traveled from Japan to Philippines to formally release him out of his duty in 1974. Well, let me tell you another story in the Bible. There is a story about Uriah. Everybody knows that, right? Uh, in the second book of Samuel, when King, when, uh, King David formally established his kingdom, he woke up late and walking on the top of the palace and saw a woman bathing. He brought her and committed an adultery. Later, he learned that she was pregnant. More than that, she was the wife of his loyal general. Do you know what David did to heed his adultery? David called Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, from the front line and asked him to go home and sleep with his wife. But next morning, David found out that Uriah didn't go to home and slept at the entrance of the palace with other soldiers. When David asked him, Uriah, haven't you just come from military campaign? Why didn't you go home? But his answer was, the ark of God and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander, Joab, and my lord's men are camping in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? He said, as surely as I live, I will not do such things. Wow, he was a very loyal and responsible man, right? Well, these two examples are sort of extreme cases. But these two soldiers teach us how to be responsible. Nehemiah was also a responsible man, like Ryan, heroes. He did not go to governor's mansion to have a good sleep. He did not say, I'm an important leader. I need good food and sleep to do many good things. But he slept with others without taking off his shoes in cloth. The opposite of responsibility is negligent. Negligent people never take full responsibility. They make constant excuses to cover their laziness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 through 4 says, and the things you have heard me say, interest reliable people will also be qualified to, to teach others. Join with me, suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serve as a good soldier that involves 
get entangled in civilian affairs, but rather try to please his commanding officer, Jesus. Well, let's be men man and women of responsible. May God help us to be responsible men and women who can please our commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, as I told you why I chose uh, the leaders, leadership of Cyrus, well, God chose him to bring back his people from Babylonian captivity, right? Also, he was known as the greatest, one of the greatest uh, leaders in human history. That's the reason. And it's worthy to study about uh, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus, people call Kirus. Well, sometimes I say Kirus, sometimes I say Cyrus, but both are the same, uh, same name, right? Okay. Um, really, I cannot avoid to talk about uh, uh, Kirus, king of Persia, since Kirus was the one of the uh, one who really liberated his people uh, from Babylon captivity. If we read uh, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, in the year of 1st Kirus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoke by Nehemiah, the Lord moved the hearts of Cyrus, king of Persia, to take a proclamation throughout his realm and also be put in the writing. This is exactly the same as 2nd Chronicles chapter 36, verse 22. Two, exactly the same. If we, we look at the Second Corinthians chapter 36, 23, previous uh, verse 22 is uh, basically what God said to uh, Cyrus. Now, verse 23 is Cyrus himself says why he returned the Jews actually to uh, Jerusalem. He says, this is how Cyrus, king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of earth, and he has appointed me to build the temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. And of his people, among you, may go up, and may the Lord your, uh, their God be with them. Wow! He knew that God chose him. You know, you know, I was shocked when I studied over Cyrus. That is uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 44, 28, and chapter 45, verse 1. Isaiah was written, the book of Isaiah, 150 years before Cyrus was born. But there is his name, Cyrus. And God said, I chose Cyrus to deliver his people from the bondage of Babylonian captivity and rebuild his temple. What this tells us, God is the ruler of human history. So let's find out uh, who was Kiros king of uh, Persia. Okay? Now, Socrates, you know the Socrates. Of course, he had many uh, uh, his disciples. He had two di uh, disciples, Plato and Snephon. Most people knew about the Plato, but uh, not many people know about the Snephon. Snephon was a philosopher, soldier, politician, and missionary. Well, uh, the world knew that Greek soldiers were known as the excellent fighters. So big nations want to hire Greek soldiers as a missionary. Now, missionary was a paid soldiers, right? So they fought uh, whoever paid them. Once Snephon was hired by Persia to fight against other countries as a missionary, along with uh, 2,000 uh, Greek soldiers. While he was in Persia, he learned about Kirus and wrote the book, Kirupedia. Kirupedia in English is 
Kirus education or education of Kirus. It was such an excellent book. I really recommend you to read. After reading this book, the well-known world leaders like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin in America, Peter Drucker, the modern economic scholar, and David Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, said that Kirus was the one of the greatest leader in human history. It's very true. Do you know that uh, Kiru Petia became the first leadership book in the Middle Age? It teaches us how to grow as a leader and what kind of leader one should be. Anyone who wants to be a leader in the Middle Age, they must read two books, Kiru Petia and uh, Plutarchus Lives. Plutarchus Lives means Plutarchus Korean Yeonghungjeon. They say that these two books became mirrors for princes, uh, princesses. Princesses does not necessarily princesses, okay? All right. In Korea, we call the Gunju, Manaki, Gunjuron. What is a mirror? A mirror is something that deflects oneself. Likewise, anyone who wants to be a leader should read these two books to see if they discover their reflection in the book. Machiavelli, one who wrote the uh, Kunjuron, Machiavelli, who wrote the Prince Kunjuron, chose the four great leaders. There were Moses in the Bible, Deus as the Greek Athen hero, Romulus, the founder of Rome, Kirus, the king of Persia, Machiavelli, I'm sorry, Machiavelli, <laughs> Machiavelli said in his book, a leader should use his mind and heart and train himself to lead his people. For this, the leaders must read the history books and study previous great leaders' achievement of their contribution carefully. Then they could be great leaders. For example, Alexander Great learned from Achilles. Julius Caesar learned from Alexander the Great. Suspio learned from Kirus. Do you know who is Suspio? He won the battle with uh, Hannibal. This is a great man because he learned from uh, 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 Kirus. Next. The English historian Charles Freeman, who was a specialist in uh, history of ancient Greek and Rome, said that there are many leaders who conquered other kingdoms and empires, right? But those colonial people never liked their conquerors. Absolutely, right? But Kirus was respected by his colonial people. They called him their fathers. Father. Alexander conquered, conquered and destroyed Persia Empire, but did not bring peace to the conquered, conquered land. But Kirus brought the peace to conquered places. If you go to the uh, UN, you can find the replica of the Cyrus Cylinder on the second floor of the UN headquarters in New York. In 1897, the English explorers who were sent by the British Museum to the old city of Babylon found the Cyrus Cylinder. There were 45 lines with two parts. First part, lines 1 through 8, 18, tells the story of uh, Kirus' deeds. The first line I want to read, it says, I'm Kirus, the king of the universe, the great king, the powerful king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, the king of four quarters of the world. 
while he bragged about himself, right? But there is a remarkable story. In the second part, he gave a religious freedom to the all colonial nations and also said that neighbors had the right to receive their pays. Even slaves must have respected the social status. He also declared that no one had the right to make any man or woman as their slaves because of their death. He said everyone had an equal right despite of races. Who could imagine the 6th century BC man, heroes, has such a thought and philosophy to rule the people with openness to embrace his colonies. Wow, it's amazing, right? He could rule 29 countries in three continents from some part of Greece to the Indus River in India. His kingdom was bigger than Alexander the Great and Roman Empire. Well, there was a mention about the Jewish exiles in line 32 in the Kirus Cylinder, which says, The gods who dwelled there, I returned their homes. That could be the confirmation of releasing captive Jews. Everyone believed that Kirus was and or made the first charter of rights. Human rights. So UN declared, put the replica of the Cyrus cylinder and made the UN nation's charters out of it. We wonder, where did his leadership come from? There are many, but I'd like to mention about two things and finish up. Okay? The first, he was a broad-minded man. You know, his grandfather, the king of Media, his name is Astaeus. His father was Cambyses, a small kingdom of Persia. I don't know if it's true, but according to the Greek historian Herodotus, Astaeus had several daughters. One night, he had a dream that one of her daughters, Mandane, peed so much water that it covers the entire land of media. So he told his advisors and astrologers to interpret his dream. One of the astrologers said to the king that someday her son would conquer the media. Wow. The king was upset, and he was really surprised, and sent the, uh, her daughter, Mundane, to marry Cambyses in Persia. So Cyrus was born to Cambyses and uh, Mundane, right? Well, after marriage, when Cyrus was 12 years old, his mother, Mundane, took him to the kingdom of Medea, after arriving there, it was Cyrus' 12th birthday. His grandfather made such a great banquet for his grandson's birthday. Then Cyrus asked his grandfather, Grandpa, Grandpa, did you prepare this banquet for me? Yes, it is for you. Then he asked his grandpa again, Can I invite anyone whom I want? Yes, you do whatever it pleases you. Then Cyrus went out on the street, invite street beggars to the banquet to eat. Isn't it surprising? 12 years old man, boy, huh? went out the street and invite the beggars. And uh, when the party was over, there was uh, still leftover food. So he gave it to those who prepare food and their families. Wow. What a boy. Can you imagine the 12 years old boy had such a mind? Cyrus was such like that. 
So when he became a king of Persia, people from Media came to him and want to be his subjects because of his broad-mindedness. You know, he didn't have to fight against Media, his grandfather's kingdom. He observed entire land of Media without fighting. Jesus is another broad-minded man, right? He was a man and friend of tax collectors and prostitutes and all kinds of sinners. He objected to anyone and anybody. So how can we have a broad-minded man and woman? Of course, we can learn from Jesus. This is my homework to you to think about whether you are broad-minded or not. Or how can you grow to be the broad minded person. Okay? All right, second, Cyrus was a man of principle. When the day was over, Cyrus needed to return to Persia. But uh, Cyrus did not want to return. So his mother asked him why he wished to stay longer. He said, Mom, I want to learn more about how to ride a horse. Well, as a young boy, I think it's good to learn uh, how to ride a horse. Then out of nowhere, his mother asked him, how will you learn justice here, where your teacher, teachers are over there? This is a story. <laughs> Cyrus answered, okay? That is one thing I understood thoroughly. What a surprise. So his mom says, how so? He replied that a, a teacher appointed him to decide the case for others on the ground that he would already thoroughly versed in justice. He mentioned about how he got flogged also for not deciding one case correctly. So his mom uh, wanted to hear from him a full account of the incident. The case was this, okay? A big boy with a little tunic find a little boy with a big tunic. So the big boy took the large tunic from the little boy and put on, and then put his small tunic on the little boy. So he said, uh, when I try this case, I decide that it would be better than both, that each should keep the tunic that uh, fit well. Well, good judgment, right? But his master flogged him, <laughs> saying, you know, if you were, you were judging what fit well, it was good, right? He has done right. But that was not the case, right? When it was my duty, his duty, to decide whose tunic belonged to who, and he had to consider whose title was the right one, whether it was right for the someone to take something away from by force or keep it, or if he would have had made it or had brought himself to own it. Anyway, uh, since after this, he said, what is lawful is right and what is unlawful is wrong. And he bade the uh, judge always render his verdict on the side of the law. Wow. Twelve years old boy, already known justice. And then, uh, you know, uh, he said, oh, mother, see, I already learned justice and its bearings. And Cyrus uh, Kyrus uh, also added, if I, do not, I, if I do require something more, my grandfather here will teach me more. Then his mother took him to a quiet place and spoke to him gently. But you know, your grandfather's coach, they do not recognize the same principles of 
judgment, uh, justice as you, they do in Persia. For your grandfather has made everything in media his own. But Persia, equality of rights is considered justice. And your father, as a king, is the first man to do what is ordered by the state and to accept what is decreed. And his standard is not his will, but the law. See here, these are remarkable statements regarding supremacy of the rule of the law in ancient times. Even the king was subject to the rule of the law. But his mom, mom said, you know, uh, when you learn your grandfather's idea and bring to Persia, you will be flogged more. And your grandfather's here is not a principle, principle uh, not with kingship, but the tyranny. So this implication teaches us that media was ruled by tyrannical, while Persia was ruled by the law, rule of the law, right? So here we can learn that everyone, whether king or slave, are equal before law. This is uh, really important. So principle of leadership should be accept, should accept supremacy of the rule of the law. In the Bible it says, James chapter 2, 9 says, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreakers. If we have a principle of justice, there will be no two yardsticks to use them as a standard for comparison when you are judging other people and things. So it is very important to know the principle of law. So we learned uh, two great men of leadership here. Leadership is not come to us naturally or inherited from our parents. Leadership can be learned from others when we are humble enough to learn. So everyone can be a great leader. So here I want to finish. I pray that each of us may be a great spiritual leader and bring others to Christ and raise them as a great leader through deep Bible study. Thank you for listening. Thank you.